Good afternoon or evening, wherever you are. This is the beginning of our build up to D-Day week. So this is the week where we're talking about all the things that were happening in advance of Operation Overlord in 1944. And then in the week itself, we'll have live shows from the beaches and some of the battles in land and we'll do some more exciting things on the ground but at the moment it's all about that preparation because we often glibly say that operation overlord was two years of planning and i mean effectively the planning for getting attacking france began in 1940 after dunkirk when, when the allies were pushed out the, the immediate thought turned to when can we go back in but i guess the planning for operation overlord itself start sometime a couple of years later but today we are talking about the importance of aerial photography the reconnaissance of france and indeed other parts of the coast because we were having to fight uh, build up a database of information about the whole of europe for various reasons that our guest will go into very shortly so my guest i'm um, joining me from england so all my guests this week are british which is a, a first i think normally i at least have at least one or two americans but this week it's all brits which is interesting so joining me from england alex burnham Hello, Alex. How are you doing? So oh, it's really nice. hat off today. We're seeing who <laughs> who can who can sport the uh, the hat the best. So Alex may be known to some people watching as one half of the history tellers duo. Uh, so some people know what that is, but for those who don't know what or who the history tellers are, who are the history tellers? Uh, well, history tellers are myself uh, and my colleague uh, Abs, Abs Wisdom, uh, and we perform history in fun, exciting sort of uh, shows, half hour little shows. Uh, so it's all proper history. We, uh, we go away, we research, we do our sort of, um, uh, you know, due diligence and all that sort of thing. But then rather than always standing up and doing a, a talk or a presentation or something like that, we sort of make it a bit more fun and family friendly. Uh, so it's just a different way to engage with history and hopefully get people excited and interested in a topic uh, and get everybody, you know, adults, kids, everybody in between sort of thing. That's the idea of the history tellers, really. And and silly hats and, and com Always. comedy yeah. outfits and costumes and sound effects and running around and generally making fools of yourself for, for, for the purpose of history. And, you know, I, I've known Abs for a long time. I only met you at Chalk Valley a couple of years ago. But you know, the effort you guys putting into your and you're going from SOE in one show, quick break, and then you're the moon landings and you're whatever the medieval this and incredible stuff. And the public just absolutely adore what you're doing. And it's that. We've talked about it so often on World War II TV. The way people understand history, there's books, there's documentaries, there's comics, there's video games, and there's, if you like, performance. And they're all as valid as one another. And it's just that spark of getting someone interested in the past. And you, you must have had so many occasions of these kids, and, and not just kids coming up to you and going, you've ignited a little interest in something that... Yeah. Completely. A few, a few years ago, we did a, a whole thing about the First World War during the like centenaries. And this, uh, this I don't know, 80s, 90s year old lady sort of went and she saw what we were doing. She came back to us the following year. This was at the Chalk Valley Festival. And she said, what we I saw you last year and what you did made me go away and investigate what my father had done in World War One. So this lady, you know, 90 something. Uh, had been excited enough to go away and research into that. So I think, you know, it's not just about getting kids interested. It's, you know, everybody really. So, um, you know, really sort of, uh, we just want to get people excited about history. And they, they then have to go away and sort of do a bit of their own research and reading and whatever. But if you're not excited, it's a lot of dry stuff in history. You've got to want to get through it. And so and it's amazing how many people i know who now are involved in the sharing of history be it podcasts or writing who actually when they were at school hated history because they had that really boring teacher who just listed dates and made it all sound incredibly boring and uh, and they had to find their own way of making it exciting and it is that connection of you know that we're walking in places that once dinosaurs walk through those yeah. same areas or that that making it that moment you go wow and you understand it so anyway that's what the history tell us and there's a link folks in the description below so you can find out about what they're doing and various shows coming up this year of course it's taken a while for the living history and history festivals to start cranking up again because of covid and all the restrictions but um certainly you're, you're going out to meet the public again but tonight we are talking about photo reconnaissance and i asked you to go and get inv involved in this and um we were talking before going live you know it's a, it, there's a lot of information out there but actually 
there wasn't as much as you perhaps thought there was going to be in the, about, about the overlord aspect. So you had to kind of dig a bit deeper. And it's that, that that's what makes it interesting is when we when we're having to learn more and stretch ourselves to put together a little a little bit of an extra show like this. It re you realize that we are often telling the same stories again, again, again. Yeah, it's what well, I mean, Abs and I and the history tellers often call it the greatest hits of history. You get stuck on these repeating the same stories over and again. And as soon as you start to look into other areas, there's some amazing stuff out there that never gets looked at because it doesn't click all the boxes that the you know, the mainstream media or whatever want to look at. Uh, aerial reconnaissance and history of photography have been my sort of um, uh, pet subjects, I suppose, for a while. And so, you know, this was a, a perfect chance to go and revisit some stuff and then like you say go and find some extra bits uh on things i had never read before so what we'll do is you've kindly as everyone has produced a little powerpoint presentation and you, we, you will start talking and then i will jump in with my interruptions as i always do and if people are watching have got questions or would like us to clarify something we will try and address that accepting that we don't always know the answers to some of the questions, but we can at least attempt to answer them. And, and it's it's an important aspect. I know as a normally tour guide, I have been saying for years, we got our information primarily from aerial photos and and, a, and some information from French resistance. And that's about all I've often had time to say, because, you know, it's just another thing you've got to spend time doing it. So that's the basics I think most of us know, but there's a big backstory. So it's the backstory you're going you're gonna to tell us. So um, yeah, I was I was going to start with a little bit of uh, history on aerial photography because uh, not everybody will know. So just to make sure we're all sort of working in the same direction on that. So um, at the end of the First World War, aerial photography had, had really sort of been big. Uh, in fact, it was uh, said after the First World War that aerial photography was perhaps the greatest weapon of the First World War. Uh, it's it got a valid claim to that. Um, and then throughout the 30s, you know, into... Uh, pre preparations for the Second World War, uh, people, there was, a, for example, a German general, uh, Werner von Fritsch, who said just before the Second World War, the military organisation with the best aerial reconnaissance will win the next war. He was predicting how important it would be. So with all that in mind, you'd think, oh, of course, we, we were brilliant at it when the Second World War broke out. Obviously not. Um, everything we'd learned in the First World War, we pretty much forgot during the uh, intervening years. And so when the war breaks out, we're not prepared. The Germans, however, they had a bit more pre-warning of the war coming and uh, they knew what they needed. So they had a better system of cameras and aircraft and that sort of thing. Uh, on the screen sort of at the moment is these. This is some of the aircraft we started using at, at the start of the war for aerial reconnaissance. And all of these aircraft had brilliant uh, niche roles during the war in which they excelled. None of them, however, made good aerial reconnaissance aircraft. They're all too big, too slow, too unmaneuverable, uh, just not the sort of thing we needed. And in general, the whole photographic sort of process was well behind the times. Uh, so early war, high losses of crews trying to take photos and very little success in what they came back with and something needed to be done. Uh, and in the end, we actually turned to a civilian, um, a chap called Sidney Cotton, who was running a sort of like a, a freelance aerial photography company out of Heston Airfield uh, in London. And he was uh, forward thinking and he'd sort of come up with ideas, things like uh, using warm air from the engines to heat the cameras so that they could fly higher without condensation and ice building up on the lenses. The RAF had never really thought about that. So their aircraft were flying too low. Uh, and just various things he, he put into motion that really set this about. Um, and so uh, Sidney Cotton had this idea of how it could be run, uh, but he was a difficult man. He uh, sort of ruffled a lot of feathers. Uh, and at the start of the war, he was doing flights over Germany as a civilian, taking photos of their military uh, installations and bringing them back and showing the RAF what could be done. And very quickly, this was realised that's not a good situation to be in, having you know, civilians flying over a, a war zone. So he was brought into the RAF and he sort of set up a new photo reconnaissance uh, squadron or flight, it was called at the time, the Heston Flight. Uh, and th this was a start of what we'd, would become photo reconnaissance units proper. Uh, we did have other units that had been flying those Blenheims and things like that. But uh, the, the start of the proper organisation was uh, with Sydney Cotton. Uh, and so as you can see on this uh, like 
basic sort of flow chart. You started with the SIS Secret Intelligence Service flight, Heston flight. Number two, camouflage unit, uh, so-called because of the colours they were painting the aircraft. Now, you've all probably seen the blue Spitfires and mosquitoes that uh, we're sort of more familiar with. Well, to sort of confuse people as to why we were painting aircraft blue, they were called this camouflage unit. Uh, and one suggestion is that the, the regular changes of names that they went through early on was part of the deception against the enemy. I'm not so sure that the enemy was that worried about our organisational structure, to be honest. I think it was just one of those uh, problems within uh, big organisations like the RAF. Yeah, this is happening in, in that 39, 40, 40, all these organisations, SOE, they're all going through their which is the which is going to be the successful formula and and we often because we look we start at the end of the war and work backwards we often look at these things from when they become successful but forget that they go through these false starts and hiccups and it takes often a while to, to, to formulate exactly how we do these things so i think this is par for the course of that time of the war exactly. Most of our new things are going through a bit of a, oh hang on that's going to work no yep yeah, no try it try something else rename it rebadge it different person leading it so that's that's normal for that time of the war. I exactly, think. yeah. And so I mean, it's got some interesting little bits, things like the, the special survey flight that morphed into Squadron uh, 212. Uh, they were in France during the Battle of France. Uh, they were sort of photographing the Allies as they retreated to Dunkirk. Uh, they were there actually after the evacuation of Dunkirk. They had to find other ways out of France uh, later on. It was a sort of um, a very early sort of use of photographic reconnaissance in our retreats and this was really useful because it was feeding back information to us here in Britain as to what was going on uh, because reports coming from Dunkirk were very confused but when you can have a photo showing you all of a sudden people can start to understand what's happening uh, so instantly the, the reorganization under Sydney Cotton was instantly proving successful uh, and you know losses were hugely down success rates of missions was hugely up uh, and so, in general, it was proved uh, a winning formula. However, Sidney Cotton had upset a few people, so he wasn't in charge for very long. It wouldn't take long for them to again reorganise. And when they come to the number one photographic reconnaissance unit, or PRU, uh, that's really when we see this on a proper military RAF footing. It's now got a, a base at RAF Benson in Oxfordshire. It's run like a proper RAF squadron or units would be. Uh, and it's no longer sort of the ad hoc systems that were in before. Um, and, it, you know, so it, like you say, it's gone through that early try it and see type method of development until something really clicks and works. And so by the time they moved to Benson in 1940, uh, it's pretty much set the, the, the shape of what will carry on. Uh, and it's hugely successful and, uh, you know, really good sort of... Um, uh, I can't think of the word. What's the uh, system? Well, just useful, I useful. suppose. And how how many roughly kind of how many sorties and the flights and photos are we doing at this point in the world? Because obviously it cranks up. By the time you get later on to Overlord, it's thousands. But at this point, you know, it's much smaller. They they they're they're gradually realizing how valuable this will become later on. So, so what kind of size operation are we talking about? Say by 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 the beginning of nineteen forty one ish. It's sort of, it, it does gradually build. So early on, they're very constrained by the amount of aircraft and air crew they have. Oh, air production, yeah. um, so when they've only got two photo reconnaissance Spitfires, obviously they are doing three or four flights a day. Uh, and that builds up. Early Spitfires uh, didn't have the range that the later aircraft would have. Uh, and so they were only really flying to the north coast of France doing very short runs because they couldn't do a lot more as technology improves and the photo reconnaissance unit grows uh, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger sort of exponentially and then like you say by uh, by the end of the war they're, they're taking thousands of photographs uh, every single day and it's uh, you know a massive uh, operation which incidentally is very similar to in the first world war how they it grows and grows and grows and you sort of you sh shake your head at how in the downtime in between all, all of those sorts of uh, ideas and understandings is just completely forgotten. Uh, you think how many early problems could have been overlooked if, if people just remembered 
what they'd done oh, previously. Well, that's the great war mentality, isn't it? That's the, the war to end all wars. We won't have to do this again. Oh, shit, here's another one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. 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 I felt yeah. a bit blunt how I said that, but yes. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, yes, that's sort of the, the, the taking of the pictures. Um, th these photos on this slide show the, the interpretation of the pictures, uh, which is sort of the second half. Because uh, although... Uh, flying a Spitfire and taking photos of the enemy is the dangerous part. The difficult bit is actually then looking at those photos and working out what useful information is on them. Uh, so early war, they have a, a, an interpretation unit in London, but blitzers and size means they have to move out and find somewhere else. Uh, and as with uh, Bletchley Park or Hewenden Manor, uh, they find a large country house uh, and they fill it with personnel who can look at pictures. So RAF Medmanham is set up in Buckinghamshire. Um, uh, this is Danesfield House, which is sort of the um, big sort of uh, stately home. And then they build all the huts in the grounds. And it's full of, uh, you might be able to make out in the picture, both men and women uh, who look at these photos and um, try and understand what it is they're after. And it is one of those great sort of uh, examples of how uh, men and women were used in different roles during the war. Obviously, the men were only the ones allowed to fight, but uh, some of the biggest sort of uh, uh, important discoveries back home were often done by women working in uh, places like Bletchley Park or here at RAF Medmanham, where they were working alongside the men doing exactly the same job and proving themselves just as good, if not better. Uh, and so you had this large group of both Royal Air Force and Army interpreters uh, work here alongside each other. Um, and it's a really interesting early example of uh, sort of the, the uh, close cooperation between forces. So later on, you had sort of combined operations and things like that, which tried to bring all the forces together. But photo interpretation had been doing it all along. So the RAF started off doing all the interpretation but it was very quickly realised they didn't always know what the army needed to look for. So they were RAF interpreters were very good at spotting bomb damage or targets for bombers and that sort of thing. But they had no idea on looking for salient points for military uh, uh, ground sort of warfare. Uh, so they were overlooking stuff that was actually vital for the army. So they brought in army photographers to walk, work alongside. They trained with each other. They worked together. Uh, and although it was expected to be sort of um, difficulties, you know, the two forces not getting on, all that sort of thing, it actually worked really well. And they cooperated exceptionally well to produce some really good uh, results, uh, which I think pays huge dividends later on when big operation like Overlord is being planned. Having a wealth of knowledge across sort of different disciplines uh, rather than just one focus group who could spot airfields uh, or something. has to have that slightly out-of-the-box thinking as well. I mean, because we know that later on, when we get into deception, there are all sorts of creative people coming. I mean, when you think about the ghost army, uh, the Americans say you bring in people from with set designers who know how to use false perspective for camouflage and things like that. So the enemy and us are learning of techniques how to disguise things. So therefore... The people who are interpreting the photos of hidden stuff have to be up to date with the new techniques of having to hide stuff because obviously everyone just starts off painting things green in the first world war to kind of hide them and then it gets a little bit more complex that with netting and camouflage and then shat the use of shadow and, and and you know you see that with the development of, of infantry tactics you know shape conceal size all those things and the same thing all these same rules to apply so they must have to bring in people who can look at things objectively and look at uh, and understand how shadows and perspective and how things may be being able being hidden uh because yeah the enemy are hiding things yeah completely it, it's possibly you know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole so it's possibly a future show um later down the line but there are amazing photos of the turpits which has been disguised to look like a fishing village by building fake frontages onto the battleship to make it look like it's uh, a sort of a village up against a, a, a cliff uh, and they're trying to hide something you know from photo reconnaissance which you know uh, wouldn't normally be uh easy to hide but as yeah. you know uh, 
whole range of understanding for the interpreters. Uh, for example, if you if you bomb a, a site and you go back next week and take another photo and they've fitted defences to that site, you know you've not destroyed it because they're now trying to defend it better. So you've got to think, well, what have they done and why have they done it? And so all of a sudden putting barbed wire out around the site means that they're trying to protect something that maybe they weren't before. So you've got to look for little signs that would be easily overlooked if you didn't know what the, the, those signs could mean. Uh, and things like scorch marks on the ground, which can signify large artillery pieces, because when they, they fire, they're going to leave uh, trails and traces. So even if the guns are hidden in woods, they can sometimes be given away by scorch marks on the field in front of them. So it's some very clever things. And then some very technical things, certainly when they start bringing in sort of radar sites, being able to look at something on a photo and recognise it as a radar mast, like you say, from the shadow alone, well, normally, you know, you wouldn't understand necessarily what the technology of a radar mast look like, but you've got to be able to understand that to be able to spot it. So there's some really clever work going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. The, you're the looking internet. for something, but you don't actually know what it is you're looking for until you see it. It's yes. A, it's a weird paradox. You know, yes. Yeah. And, and, and the whole, I mean, sure yet, but you'll know it when you see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, when we, we chatted just before about the, the search for like V1 and V2 rockets, for years we were searching for things that we didn't know what they were, where they were, what they looked like, but we knew they were sort of there. We were looking for this evidence. Uh, and so they were sort of searching everywhere and coming up with all sorts of ideas that either did or didn't relate to V1 and V2 rockets, but uh, they knew something was there. And so it's, a, it's very much a needle in the haystack sort of approach. Yeah. So it, it's useful to know. And, uh, and, uh, when they sort of got going, they can start to look at uh, things like this. This is, you know, quite an easy one, I suppose. But this just shows how useful a, a, an aerial photo can be um, when you see sort of something as obvious as um, uh, this is, you know, the heavy cruiser Sadlitz, I think, possibly mangled pronunciation there. So you can see the, the, the ship in the dock. You can see all of the other ships that are going on. You can watch by repeated visits to this same site. You can watch its construction and uh, you, you can start to plan where you think it is in its construction period. Then you know when it will roughly be launched. So you know when's the best time to attack it. Yeah. Uh, and so they started to plan bombing raids at times which would get the best result, which would slow down the production or put them back a stage. Or uh, you, if you start to use photo reconnaissance in a clever way it's not just showing you what's out there it's helping you plan what you can do next uh, and so this is you know sort of um uh, by I mean, this one's 1942 so about this time we, we're really starting to you know use photo reconnaissance in a in a very smart fashion um which by this point has given us the upper hand uh in terms of intelligence against uh, the germans their their photo reconnaissance although it it started quite well. It tails off very quickly uh, and they very, very quickly lose sight of what we're doing um, in comparison to you know, our understanding of, of them and their capabilities. Well, as the war goes on, they're, they're struggling to do everything well, aren't they? Because all of their resources, as our resources and our, and our ability to do things is rising, theirs across the board is decreasing. So, yeah, of course... Uh, I say, of course, but our, as our graph goes up, theirs is going down. So, yeah, and, and yeah, it's, it, it makes sense that. Yeah, and I read somewhere that uh, the German mentality was very much put, put more soldiers in the front line, whereas ours, for every soldier in the front line, we would put a couple of people in the back rooms doing other jobs, logistics and photography and intelligence. And, and so in the long game, that pays dividends because the soldiers are, are able to fight better. Although yeah. they might be outnumbered, they're fighting smarter. Um, yeah, better, efficiency, so, better efficiency. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I think it, it comes down to a sort of a basic uh, a, a principle sort of adopted very early on by Allied command of how we were going to use resources. Uh, and photography is part of that. Um, and this is because there's bound to be some people watching who want to know about aeroplanes. This is some nice pictures of aeroplanes. There's already been a big discussion at sidebar about ranges and aircraft. It's, uh, yeah. As yeah. expected. Yeah, and so I mean these these aren't the earliest ones. Spitfires uh, and then the mosquitoes a bit later on went through all sorts of variants and changes. And there's an awful lot of technical detail in uh, just these two aircraft alone. 
uh, to do with uh, placement of uh, cameras, the, the fuel tanks, uh, the modifications used for photo reconnaissance aircraft, all that sort of thing. Um, it's a, a, a huge subject just on its own. I'm sure plenty of uh, Fly Past magazine articles have been filled with details on what these aircraft were and how they developed. Um, but it was a really, it, it, it is, you know, it's an interesting subject because it was a case of looking at what the previous one did, what you wanted the next one to do, and trying to develop something that did it better. Uh, there are a few spanners in the works uh, here and there, but in general, both aircraft developed throughout the war into uh, much more efficient versions of themselves, um, which, you know, is, is an interesting, if you're into sort of the technical side of these sorts of things, it is an interesting little uh, thread to follow, um, mm. but it is a huge rabbit hole that um, yeah, I've got an entire book on photo <laughs> PR Spitfires. So yeah, it's it's a big yeah. subject. But essentially, uh, we're going uh, the the British tenny and the Americans kind of adopt our. We'll bring the Americans later on. But we're going for get in and get that photo quickly and get out quickly. That that's that's our 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 trick is the is speed. That that really uh, yeah, is effectively uh, altitude as well. Certainly uh, later on, uh, altitude sort of plays a bigger part. Mosquitoes could fly very fast, very high. Uh, and so with and, and quite a long range. And so you could be trundling over sort of most of Europe in a mosquito taking pictures without people really knowing you were there half the time. Um, and it, interesting, it's these are the aircraft that first bring out the problem of contrails, the condensation trails from air engines, because these are the first people who are going high enough to produce those and then realizing, well, that's a huge, great marker anyway, as to yeah. you are there in the sky. Uh, and so it was a sort of one of those big problems that they had to then sort of figure, do you fly a bit lower or do you have a contrail? And it's just sort of, um, uh, yeah, like you said, whole books on these things, which which we haven't got time to sort of follow now. Um, but it's all very interesting stuff. Um, but now I suppose we'll, we'll get to the D-Day bit. Um, so in terms of aerial photography, uh, planning for D-Day started in may of 1942 uh which was when it was decided we want to do an invasion but we don't know really where or how or what we want to do uh, and so the first thing really was to figure out well where can we invade we know we want to invade europe um there was all sorts of calls you know russians want us to open up a front very quickly to relieve pressure on them we're sort of in the med do we go up through italy and that sort of thing which we sort of do um but there's this idea of we want to do something north europe uh at some point in the future um churchill in particular was very sort of very reluctant to get involved too soon and i think he and his advisors realized that it was a one-shot chance if you do it too early and fail you might never really get that second go at it so it had to be done right so it was sort of um although it annoyed maybe some of our allies i think they had to wait until they knew what they were doing uh, and so a start of the early planning was to set up a secret group of interpreters so a, a group of army interpreters about 20 army interpreters were taken from ref medmenham and put here in uh, norfolk house in london uh, where they set up a group which was specifically designed to look at the European coastline, searching for valid invasion sites. And so it's a pretty open task, really. Uh, they just had to look for something that was workable and weigh the pros and cons. Uh, I really, I found out as I was looking uh, that that lovely Norfolk house, as I think, had been pulled down recently, which is a great shame um because wow. um, it had all sorts of allied headquarters and things in there you know big big names sort of generals and things were working in there as well as things like this photo don't tell me it's a primark or something awful like that i think it's being redeveloped but i don't i i, I just saw you know, it's a shame but um i was i was thinking maybe i'll be able to get down there and visit it but maybe not now anymore so um this this special sort of uh research group uh of interpreters is given a brief to look along the uh coast from sort of um uh the the border with spain all the way up the french coast into uh sort of um uh, netherlands sort of area looking for somewhere to invade basically uh, so this is sort of a, a good sort of 
thousand miles of coastline, whatever it is, um, possibly more. But they were also looking for 30 miles inland because obviously you need to be able to plan not just the invasion, but the the follow up, the, 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 the making the foothold. Uh, and so it's about 32,000 square miles of Europe they had to research. Uh, and they didn't want to do this by sending aircraft specifically to photograph this because that's quite obvious. The Germans would start to realise we were mapping the coastline. So it was done by getting just the normal photo reconnaissance aircraft to take pictures as they flew over coast or as they were on other uh, sorties. They would just collect the relevant photographs and they would add those to uh, the interpretation pile. And so this whole area is, is starting to be in depth sort of um, uh, looked at by uh, a group of people who, uh, who were looking for something you know, suitable uh, for a landing. Um, but at this point, I, I have to sort of say it's not not just down to photo reconnaissance. They have a big network of information coming in that the photo reconnaissance plays just one part of. Um, and so you've got the photo reconnaissance finding pictures, which can also then produce maps. Uh, but then you've got things like uh, SOE and resistance agents on the ground who are providing you know, sort of data from, from a lower level. Uh, you've got uh, a whole sort of um, range of intelligence groups who in England are collating stuff that they can find. So pre-war Michelin maps are being looked at. Uh, brochures for holiday homes in Normandy are being collected and looked at. All of this is sort of piecing together, trying to find uh, all the details they can so that when the planners of D-Day sort of... Uh, ask where do you think we can go they haven't just got nice pictures to go by they've got it's, a sort it's, of it's, here, isn't it? it's multiple sources if yeah if the aerial photo and the local information you're getting from the resistance of the soe and your pre-war data and perhaps what you're picking up from ultra via enigma if they're all saying this city is a really big transport hub we want to then you've got that four ways it's likely to be true isn't it it's it's as you said earlier Operation Overlord, which probably hadn't been named by then, is a is essentially a one-off. Screw up, and we're not doing it again. So you've got to have every single T crossed, every single I dotted, to make sure you've got as much data as you possibly can to minimise the risk uh, and, and ensure, hopefully, a successful invasion. That's right. I mean, the next next slide has got sort of a, a bit of again a little bit of a flow chart of um, some of the ways that information is coming in. So you've got a whole sort of swathe of people looking at this and it's all feeding into the planning stages uh, like i said i'm not sure when overlord is is given when it's got that title i think it possibly has previous titles and later titles and all sorts yeah, in between yeah, sort of lots of times. Yeah, yeah. um but it's all plan you know it's all sort of putting information in there was a a brilliant thread on i think it was facebook or whatever recently somebody had put up a did you know when, when planning d-day they looked at postcards of normandy uh, and there was one chap on there who refused to believe it. He, uh, you know, was was spouting off, well, they they were not going to plan a, a massive invasion based on old photographs on you know postcards they picked up. Uh, but they completely did. It wasn't the only source of information. Yeah, but yeah. they were they were getting every single bit because it only takes uh, a brochure for a holiday home that says and walk down our private path to the beach, and instantly you know that there's a path up from the dunes to the mainland or whatever, and. It's tiny little bits of information like that that could later. But I, I, know that, I know it's a potential rabbit hole to go down, but what I've always liked about that story because they put, yeah, they, they they put out that request saying send your holiday snaps, didn't they? But of course, what they wanted was to say send us your holiday snaps of interesting places in beaches and cities and road networks. But you can't say that you had so everyone sent in their photos, including of Uncle Jack on the donkey, at the, <laughs> you know, and they had to have all of those, and they're not set. They couldn't then send back the inappropriate ones. They've obviously in the, in this box room, in wherever it is, Whitehall, is all the photos, including of Uncle Jack on the don on the donkey in San Marlo in 1939, and of Dorothy and Daisy eating ice creams in in Brittany. They all have to be there as well. And then we never sent them back. We never sent those photos back. They they the families all sent them off, and they are they are whether they are still there, or whether they got destroyed at some point. But you know, it's it, we because this is bringing up this idea, which you 
alluded to a minute ago of this chess game, this secrecy in that mm. we we want to find information, but we can't let them know that we're finding information. We want to get photos of this in their area, but we don't want the Germans to find out we're interested in this area. We want to get intelligence, but we mustn't let the public know that we're interested in Normandy any more than we're interested in Denmark or Germany. Or so it's a, it's a, the balancing of this effort is extraordinary. Oh, completely. And, and they were doing the same, not just for, for Overlord, but there's brilliant um, story on the, the dams raid where they were looking at uh, postcards of the, the, the dams in the Ruhr Valley that they'd got for information. And somebody said, oh, we've got the plans for those dams because before the war, the plans had been sent to a, a firm, I think, in Wales who were building a similar dam. And so we had complete technical specifications tucked away. But unless somebody sort of comes forward with that, it's it's not always obvious. But that's why they had to put out those sort of appeals for information. And like I said, just takes that photo of Uncle Jack on the donkey just has to have one thing in the background of use. And all of a sudden you you've got some useful sort of usable information uh, so it is an interesting sort of um well, well it's a process i suppose that I, I wanted to make sure people didn't think photo reconnaissance can do all uh well, i'll come back to that in a bit but photo reconnaissance really can't do all it's a very good tool but it's it's one of those you have to balance it with with some other things um uh so we've we've started sort of our, our planning for overlord with with these photographs uh and they're, they're producing lots of interesting information um and so it's about sort of um collecting all that sort of data together but it's becoming a huge job for the fo pr1 pru the one photographic reconnaissance unit uh so again like earlier on they decide to split the unit up into sort of different structure um and this time they they split it from being a a unit into individual squadrons and they put it on a more sort of um RAF footing again, uh, where they, they rename the, the flights into individual squadrons, they bump up the numbers. And so we're flying an awful lot more sorties. And again, we've got more aircraft by this point, and it's just getting into a bigger uh, uh, organisation in general. Um, because everybody wants pictures. Uh, you've got the, the Navy want photographs of uh, battleships, in particular, things like turpits. Uh, the um, RAF want to know where to bomb and how their bombing went. The army want to know about maps and situations. And obviously it's not just happening in Europe. We're also taking pictures in North Africa, in, in Italy and wherever the fighting is. Uh, and so an awful lot of pressure is being put onto photo reconnaissance. Um, at times it, it gets a bit tense. Certainly you know, Bomber Harris is very, their aeroplanes, they should be working for us. Uh, and other people say, well, no, we need information. Coastal Command, who had been in charge of 1PRU for a while, were using them to photograph you know, uh, naval targets, uh, which wasn't as much help for the bombers. And, and so, it, you know, the normal sort of political wranglings that go on during these things. Um, but we start to sort of develop and by enlarging this as they go uh, and setting up a uh, photo reconnaissance training squadron, so they're not just taking people from other squadrons. They're starting to train people, train pilots from scratch how to do the job. Uh, it sort of it works into that sort of becoming more efficient. Um, so here yeah, you can see that the one PRU is split into uh, the five squadrons um, who is then feeding into the uh, what's then called the Allied Central Interpretation Unit at Medmenham because the Americans have now come in as well. As I was talking about cooperation earlier between Army and Air Force, we've now got Americans in the same place. And again, the cooperation is really good. Um, it looks a bit dodgy to begin with. The, um, the chief of the like the American interpretation side uh, is actually the son of the president. So he's sort of throwing his weight around a little bit, uh, but very quickly he gets told, no, we know what we're doing. You follow our lead. And he does. And uh, it, again, the whole uh, the integration between the allies and the different services all together is incredibly sort of forward thinking for its time. You know, now, nowadays there's a lot more sort of people work together in different services back then. It wasn't really as heard of as much. Yeah. Um, so you've still got the army photographic people at Norfolk house and they're all feeding in as well as doing the other work of photographing everything that's out there basically. Um, and then a bit later on, uh, they're on this slide, but they're not quite, uh, sort of there yet you've got the americans coming over with their photo reconnaissance squadrons we'll come back to them in a bit but they're, they're sort of starting to 
uh, coming to the European war, because obviously they've been over in the Pacific and uh, part of uh, Churchill's delaying of Overlord was to wait for American support in Europe, which uh, wasn't there. Yeah, and the land aircraft and all those other things. And I, yeah. and I wanna, you, something you just said a minute ago, I think it's worth reinforcing for the viewers as well, is that it's we may only get that one resource of postcards because once the families have sent their postcards, there, there are no more of that. But with aerial reconnaissance, it's not that we want a single map, a single photo of every bit of Europe. We want repeated photos of those because it it's the progression and changes that we're most interested in it's, the, it's what is happening to that port what is happening to that railway yard that installation there so that when they i know you're the guy i'm not stealing your thunder it's that interpretation and comparison when you talk when you talk about trying to identify how uh, the work is going on a german shipyard it's that how much work is being done at this site compared to this site because that's the kind of stuff if you can work out Look, the Germans seem to be doing a lot of construction there because that has doubled inside in two weeks. Whereas this location that's 200 miles away, they've been six months and they haven't put any more bricks in yet kind of thing. So it's that continued thing. And then someone's got to file all that as well. And someone's <laughs> going to have all those th those photos available. Someone said, can you, can you get me last week? It's a mammoth task. Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of what they were doing is incredible. Thousands of pictures coming in. They then, like you say, have to be cross-referenced with previous weeks, months, whatever, and conclusions have to be reached which make sense and are helpful. Um, mm. and, and all of that is is a, a big skill, really. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, just to interrupt, just a couple of questions came in. We're talking about the aerial reconnaissance here, but those, that same Allied Central Interpretation Unit, is that where the photos from things like submarines are going as well? That, and ground, is that all going through that same, same place? Uh, I don't know if uh, photos from submarines and that sort of thing would be going there, to be honest. Uh, this was specifically set up for photos from aircraft. Some, uh, somewhere in the chain of command, yeah. up, maybe they, someone would be comparing aerial stuff. To oh, is this, uh, would that be in, in regards to Overlord specifically? Because well, the Overlord planning would be getting photos from multiple sources and... Yeah. So you did have uh, a craft off the coast of Normandy, say, taking pictures of beaches yeah. uh, from a little way out. That wouldn't have gone to RF Medman, and that would have been sent to the Overlord planning people somewhere to be compared with yeah. uh, uh, aerial so photos we're, we're, or whatever. That. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Good, sir. So it has at this point, you know, you could be forgiven for thinking that it's the, the sort of the – the cure-all aerial photography does have a huge amount of potential in it uh but there are some sort of downsides to aerial photography and the next picture sort of really sort of shows uh what that is this is i mean you can ignore the picture itself this is a picture of guam so it's not normandy related in any way but you can see that one very simple thing has made this photo only half useful and that's cloud cover um and if you think the weather is hugely variable well last few days in england have shown how variable it is over here uh but when you're taking off from oxfordshire and you're flying to uh, the north coast of france the the weather can change completely within that distance and so you have an awful lot of very simple things like uh cloud cover uh camouflage as we said uh and just things that are difficult to find from uh aerial photos um this was particularly shown in the diep raid which was sort of that uh, had so many lessons to learn for d-day later on um one of the issues uh, when they landed on diep was they relied a lot on aerial photography in their planning but that hadn't shown up gun emplacements in the cliffs and so we just had no idea that they were there so as we landed there was more enemy firepower than we had anticipated and so it was one of those things that led to Diet being such a uh, difficult sort of landing be careful because david o'keefe of of um of um one day in august is watching so if we go down <laughs> too deep a Diet rabbit hole he will pick us up and but yeah no we're absolutely right yeah yeah. It's, um, yeah yeah i mean i did i came across a brilliant Diet rabbit hole the other day about the reason for the raid being trying to catch an enigma machine from the that's, that's hotel. David's point that is his point yeah that uh, is which was a, a brilliant i've never heard this before but uh it's not the time to do it now but um 
a lot of the planning on that was very, very focused on what the aerial photos showed us. They didn't show us enough, basically. And so this was very much learnt by uh, overlord planners, and they, they realised, well, we need to have a more rounded view. And this is where the postcards of Uncle Frank on the donkey come in, because you can't tell everything from this one aerial picture, which, uh, you know, it, it, it has lots of good information in, but maybe not everything you need. So you need to start looking uh, at different angles, quite literally. Um, we've not really mentioned you the types of photographs that you get from aircraft. You have these sort of vertical overhead ones, which are brilliant for, for making maps or uh, sort of showing an overview of a situation. You also have what's called oblique photographs, uh, which are sort of taken from the side of an aeroplane. So you get more of an overview of the the landscape uh, from there rather than uh, a, a plan down. So this is a, an oblique of Normandy beaches. Um, I'm not sure entirely which beach that is. You might be able it's to. Landing, so it's further up north. It's somewhere. It's not. I when I first oh, yeah. found that one, I was I I I, I, I hoped it was going to be Omaha Beach because it looked vague if it wasn't. Yeah. It was way up the other side of um. It's towards oh, right, the other half somewhere. I always what? hoped it was going to be, but it's not <laughs> Omaha. I, I think that publish it as being Omar, and it looks like it could be, but it isn't. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, I picked it just because it, it really illustrates why uh, an oblique is so useful. You can see on there that uh, the flat sands, the sort of the cliffs running along the edge of the beach, the, the hills sort of off to the left of the picture, the, the rocky outcrops on the beach itself. All of this information is sort of there in the, in the vertical shot, but it doesn't sort of show you quite as well necessarily the, the lay of the land. Um, vertical shots, there is a trick, obviously, with vertical shots. If you take two at the same time and use your little stereo viewer, you can see them in three dimensions. And that's uh, the, the picture we had as our sort of like title card, had a man looking through a little uh, sort of contraption at a, at a photograph. Uh, sometimes these were magnifying glasses. Other times it's two little lenses, which then make, there you go, uh, I think that might be a magnifying he's looking through there. But anyway, you had these ones with two lenses, which would then give you a three dimensional view of the uh, photograph, which, again, helps like with using shadows to interpret the picture. It helps you give sort of flesh to the. the, the and this is when the there's this, this cross pollination of data, because identifying shadows is no good unless you can then if you know what time the, the, the photo was taken so of course the photos have the time and the date on them and the sorted so it's that gradual realization that a photo on its own is one part of the jigsaw puzzle but it's it's all that combined information the obliques with the aerials how you interpret it use getting the 3d information of it and then finally you can start building up a picture and then of course repeating the sortie a week later to see what change has been made in that time Yes, quite. And yeah, it is, uh, I think, a relatively, well, could be a slow process when you've got lots and lots of people working on it. It speeds it up rather. But there's an awful lot of information in a picture that sometimes is irrelevant and you've got to know what to look at and what not to. And, and that's sort of where the skills came in. Uh, and so we were using uh, the mixture of uh, verticals and obliques. These are some very low level obliques, which are quite amazing. If you think that Spitfire, sort of the top left picture was probably, you know, 50 feet off the ground herring along the, the Normandy coast taking pictures. Um, but these these are showing some of the defences that were being built on the beaches. Uh, an overhead picture of that wouldn't have been much help because it, it would just be sort of lines, dots, whatever. Uh, but by looking at these, we've then got the interpretation, which is showing the, the, the stakes in the ground and the anti-tank and anti-landing craft and all this sort of thing. And it's these types of photos that were actually revealing to us the uh, the ones with the explosives on the tops. So I forget what they called them now. Um, uh, well, you'll know tetrahedra, Tetrahedrons and the, and, the, uh, and the Class Cs. And the, oh, they, they, yeah. yeah, they all have that multiple names, yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't know they had explosives on the top until photographs were taken where one had accidentally gone off. There was a bright spot of light, and we realised people were putting things on top of poles, basically. Uh, this is then tied up with SOE information, you know, they can send somebody down to have a poke around and tell us what's going on sort of thing. And so again, it's that using multiple sources to, to build a better picture. Uh, and we were slowly beginning to understand what sort of level of defences the beaches had. And this is why uh, we chose to land at a particular time of day for where the tide was and that sort of thing. And I think uh, with the tides being further out on D-Day, 
it made a longer run for the soldiers, but it made a better landing for the landing craft. And so it was a, yeah. a, a balance of which one is going to give us the best results, basically. And, and so that, that information you can't get without that repeated uh, sort of looking at the pictures and investigation into what is actually there um, on the beach itself. Uh, and, these, uh, you know, some of these low level photographs, you can see uh, German crews who are, are building them or, you know, setting the explosives. They see an aircraft, you know, Spitfire flying over. They're hitting the deck. They're running in all directions. They're they're panicking. They don't realise they're being photographed. They just see an enemy aircraft. Uh, so there are some brilliant pictures of like the, the German crews sort of panicking and running all over the place, and you know, leaving abandoned donkeys in the middle of the beach because they're running off. And you know, it's just. Uh, I'm now picturing Uncle Zach running off on a donkey <laughs> to control now. But we, we, of course, we've now brought the elephant in the room now that we've brought in, of course, is the danger of being seen. Because we're talking about the information we're gathering, the means of gathering information from these different sources. and the story. But we're also, in parallel, we are planning an invasion that the Germans must not find out where and when it's going to take. So... This is when it gets very complicated because of the flying sorties and being seen by the Germans. We were talking before we went online. I'm being very trivial, folks, about how I describe how the Germans are trying to work at what we're doing. The Abwehr, the German intelligence, they know we're going to land somewhere. Now, it could be Normandy, could be Calais, could theoretically be Belgium, Norway, not Netherlands, possibly less likely, but still possible. And in my in my mind, as I explain it, they have these kind of blackboards or whiteboards in their office with the with the Normandy heading, the Calais heading, the, and every time they get information that suggests it's Calais, they put a tick on the Calais board. And every time they get information saying it's Norway, they put the information there. And this is all the stuff that's coming. We've got the double agents giving the count information. We've got SOE and an OSS doing stuff and blowing things up in wrong places. We've got deception campaigns, fake armies, Fuzak, but there's that physical evidence, a aircraft which by now are painted blue. So they're flying, they're nipping that one that you just, the, 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 that was taking the photos of the guys on the beach. Maybe one of those Germans knows that's a photo reconnaissance aircraft. So he goes and tells Gunter, the sergeant, I've seen a photo reconnaissance aircraft. That information goes back. Someone now goes, aha, they're taking photos of that beach. How do the allies at a high level deal with that risk? The risk the offsetting of gaining information with the risk of being finding out where we're going. Well, I think in general, they uh, they don't really deal with it. They carry on as they had been. Photo reconnaissance aircraft had been uh, pretty prevalent over Europe for years by that point. Uh, and I think the way to deal with not picking Normandy out is to continue doing operations elsewhere. So the flights over Normandy seem routine almost. Um, however, the increase as we get closer and closer to D-Day, the increase in uh, photo reconnaissance, particularly by uh, by this point, the Americans have joined us and they have the seventh photographic reconnaissance group whose pretty much sole job is taking photos of Normandy. Uh, and so it very it nearly gives the game away. Um, there's a quote by, I think, you know, one of Rommel's top sort of like second in command type guys who states, uh, I think the uh, the, Brit the British will uh, will go to church on a Sunday and invade on Monday, the 5th of June. And, you yeah, know, that was his prediction. Well, he was pretty close. Um, so people had sort of spotted this increase in activity. However, there was enough going on elsewhere to mean that they could never be certain. And and one of the reasons like that the armored divisions were never pulled into normandy proper is because there was always that uncertainty yeah, we're, 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 we're going on because we because we know that we now know that the, the landings were in normandy we talk about the reconnaissance over normandy we use the aerial photos to explain that but what we're not explaining well we we, we are now is that there we're also gaining information about calais and the netherlands and norway which we we may well need that later that's a, who's the we, we, may we still needed need maps right of those now, areas database, yeah. because you know that database then becomes because people in the sidebar are saying when's he going to mention constance babington smith and of course that car she really gets she's one of those interpreters i'll let you talk about it in a minute but her fame really comes in with the the v1s and the and the and the, and the, and the crossbow side of things but information photos we're taking of calais may not be directly useful for planning over law but they will be useful down the road down the line because that's where half the v1s end up coming from that area there so 
us having aerial intelligence about a wide area will do us good somewhere down the line. Oh, yeah. And we and we continue taking photographs routinely pretty much everywhere. Um, and I think that is partially I mean, when, when you get to Calais, you still need those maps. You still need to know what the has been left standing, what has been destroyed by retreating uh, 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 enemy and that sort of thing. So you need to continue the full scope of reconnaissance. Uh, and it's another area where the German reconnaissance sort of fell down after the early mapping of Britain by the Luftwaffe, there was never really that follow on. So they didn't really know after that initial sort of stage of the war what was going on. We continued with this relentless sort of, you know, taking pictures every single day, sometimes at the same place day in, day out. Uh, and so a lot of that information probably was unnecessary, but it gave us a much fuller picture of what was going on. Uh, Laura and I just asked about how much of the aerial photos affected our decision to land at Normandy. And that's kind of another potential big rabbit hole because, yes, we are finding out there's a lot heavier defences in Calais. The gun batteries are closer together, larger calibre, more defence up because it is theoretically the logical place to make an invasion because Calais is the shortest channel crossing. It's closer to Germany in the Ruhr Valley. And tradition, it's where the Romans were doing it, it's where the, <laughs> William the Conqueror would have been doing it, roughly. It's where the Germans themselves had sea lion have in the 90s, it was been the narrow bit there, Kent. So, so Normandy is, is, is less obvious, which makes it a better a, a attraction. But And there is more defence code. There, there's lots more reasons why we choose Normandy um, than just it being based on aerial photos. But it is part, it is part of the arsenal that is help, enabling the planners to decide what to do. Aerial photos is one of those tools they use along with yeah. everything else. And I, I think uh, they they wouldn't have been able to make the decision without the aerial photos because we, we learned very quickly in the Battle of France how out of date our maps and intelligence was yeah. of that. Uh, and so if we'd sort of sat down without the photos and said, where should we invade? Well, we'd have made huge mistakes based on duff information. Uh, so the aerial photos, I think, helped them decide I don't know it particularly made them pick Normandy specifically, but once Normandy was picked, it helped them uh, well, sort of reinforce it, 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 When you'd go, when we go, if we go back to the slide of the, uh, of the, of the whole coastline there is actually, they would have found out that huge swathes of that coast just aren't suitable. Yeah, exactly. Too, yeah. too many cliffs, not enough road network, um, not within the range of the bombers, so on and so forth. So, by taking that 32,000 square miles of photos, they're probably going to eliminate 90% of that immediately. Okay, well, no, that's no good. We, okay, maybe we can get there, okay, but there's no road links out of there, you know, or, or maybe we... So so that's how, that's part of the reason, is not is not no so much finding out where we are going to land, is eliminating where we definitely can. Yeah, okay. yeah definitely. I, and I think um, there were certain, you know, places like San Nazaire, which would have been a good sort of uh, choice because of its networks and its connections and that sort of thing. But then it's further off and where do you land? It's, you know, not, like you say, it's not particularly got big flat beaches as the same way that Normandy does, I believe in that sort of area. Yeah. So, uh, it, I think you're right. It, it would be very good, like like a giant game of what was a guess who, you know, you knock down yeah, the, the exactly. areas that are not yeah. good until you're left with something that is good. So um, I think you've got to sort of view it as part of a whole intelligence network, which is why so early on, I sort of wanted to say, photo reconnaissance isn't the, the silver bullet uh you know you can't base everything on that uh but it's really useful at certain areas um so yeah i mean once the the specific beaches even were picked uh they started to produce uh maps and models like in these pictures uh and so these are done you took a photo or a series of photographs uh sorry the model one isn't particularly good i was really finding it hard but these planning models were used in a, all across the war for you know the famous ones like the dam busters raid and uh, those sorts of things operation chariot have these big elaborate models made where people can see exactly the terrain and everything in detail and so these were made for a lot of the normandy beaches along with detailed maps which again we didn't really have the, the michelin maps pre-war weren't actually very good um and then added to that the fact that they're out of date anyway um means that we couldn't rely on it whereas you know having these very detailed maps which showed defenses which showed i mean again i don't know how how well that will come out but that marks on their you know defensive positions and uh, all the information not just 
uh, sort of of the topography and the roads and all that sort of thing but of what you will encounter um of course there are still problems the hedgerows don't come out particularly well on photographs and so that later proves to be an issue um, and I, i'm glad you chose the one appointed hawk there because that's a potential rabbit hole again because <laughs> there's, there's an occasion where actually the information that they had probably wasn't as updated as up to date as it could have been because the French resistance and Guillaume Mercadier, who came up in my resistance talk of a couple of weeks ago with Ronman, was one of the people in the network that has sent the information to the Allies via radio that we think the Germans have moved the guns inland. And although the Allies were still taking updated photos, and we pretty much know now that the intelligence departments had identified the guns had moved in land but it didn't quite filter down to some of the ranges at the bottom end of the scale which is another whole rabbit hole of exactly when you release this information who has the information because everybody can't know everything about where you're going so that, that you can you can it's a great tool to have aerial reconnaissance but it can lead you down um into an error if you over rely on it and, uh, and don't update the information so it is it is fantastic oh, no, completely. Is question, by the way alex from the great dominion about about and i know you're you particularly you, you know you know your photography yeah about photo flash bombs the mosquitoes use for night stuff you could do a bit more technical stuff about photos you could do that or if you want to uh well briefly that the nighttime photography was a great sort of technical challenge because uh, obviously it's dark and you need light for photography so these these flash bombs that were dropped uh, sometimes by mosquitoes, uh, very early on by a lot of Wellingtons that, that were used for this. Uh, they proved reasonably successful, um, but were actually taken away from the photo reconnaissance unit. Uh, and uh, a lot of the nighttime photography was then done by, I'm going to get the wrong number, something like 162 Squadron. Uh, but please don't quote me on that, whoever asked the question, because I think I might be wrong. But uh, a lot of the night photography was taken up by a specialist group, effectively. Um, but it did prove useful. And then later on, uh, lots of bombers, just part of the course, would have flash bombs and cameras. So every raid would be photographed. So by the end of the war, you know, lots of Lancasters would end up with equipment on board so that every raid came back with some detail. Um, information about how successful a raid was was hugely important. And at times you had uh, photo reconnaissance aircraft flying over uh, sort of half an hour behind the bombing stream, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they would wait till enough of the smoke had cleared and then get, come back with a picture pretty much i suspect with the speed of a mosquito overtaking the lancasters on the way back so as the bombers returned the pictures were already there as to how well they did uh that was sort of a sign of how efficient the, the yeah that's a really good indication of how this system has progressed yeah from a civilian taking photos of his own aircraft four years earlier to bomber crews getting back certainly by 1945 that was tony redding came out that last week about people getting back and then being shown the aerial photos yeah. of the yeah. results of that that's insanely good isn't it <laughs> yeah it. And here's what yeah. you, you know they, they say yeah i think we hit it no you didn't here's the photo that said you missed you know that is insanely good and it, it was things like that that proved how um our radio guidance the like the oboe and g and all the, well, those yeah. sorts of things uh, the early early trials of that we thought they were brilliant and then we started getting pictures back that showed they actually weren't as reliable certainly over long distances as we thought and it was only due to the photo reconnaissance that we could assess sort of how technology was improving on bombing sides and that sort of thing uh so it's yeah another area of uh, uh how the photo, photo photography sort of that information can be useful yeah. Uh, and yeah, it is uh, one of many rabbit holes to go down. Yeah, and I feel bad about yeah. going down these rabbit holes because we've still got a few slides to go. We've been at it an hour now, so it's my fault for going down these tangents. No, sorry, yeah. sorry. Like we know, we, we we put these shows together. We think, oh, it'll be all right. Then you realise just how many potential things there are to talk about. Um, yeah, and you know, and and each one leads to another story that leads you down another. Yeah, it's amazing. It's I, I certainly I. You often think, certainly with like the Second World War, oh, we know everything we can about that. It was only whatever now, 70 odd years ago. Um, but then you just think, well, actually, that's complete nonsense. Yeah, there's so much out there I don't know. And probably uh, there's stuff out there that nobody knows that we'll yet to yeah. find out. So it's you know incredible. Uh, and this is one, actually, I had a lot of trouble finding this picture that we've got on screen now. In the end, uh, the D-Day story, which is a museum down in Portsmouth, which is worth a visit. They had some online, so I stole it from them. So 
do sort of pay them back by visiting them or something. Uh, yeah, they're um, good people there. They won't, they, won't, they won't mind. No, quite. But this is an oblique photo taken from technically zero feet, you know, as low as a Spitfire can fly above the waves of the ocean, of the beach. And this has been marked. And uh, this is they've crossed out the River Orne. So I'm guessing it isn't. But they thought it was at some point, I, I, I assume. But anyway, these were given to the, the pilots, the coxswains on the landing craft on D-Day as a guide to where to land. Uh, and there were whole books and guides of yeah, what to do and how to follow it. But these were literally, I, I assume, sort of laminated against the waves in some uh, way um, so that they could find their spot on the beach. So everybody had this sort of photo to, to follow in, uh, which, you know, A, it's amazing that they were taking these photos so low level, but it's a brilliant sort of visual representation. When you're going in, the last thing you want to do is to try and marry up a, a map to what you're seeing in front of you, which from the ocean is actually quite difficult to do unless there's something really obvious. Whereas this is showing you a, a, a sort of a, a landscape that you can then instantly recognize. Um, and when the, the Americans sort of who got pushed so far off their landing course, they would have very quickly realized that it wasn't matching up with their pictures at all. Um, whether they could do anything about it or not, I suppose at that point isn't. Uh, well, isn't this is where you get. In, this is where you get into the specifics of the different topography of the beaches, because alas, Utah and Omaha had less, dist fewer distinctive features. They didn't. Th there are some church towers in Omaha, but they're a little bit away inland and with the smoke and stuff like that. So it turned. It turned out that. Sword and Juno, I suppose, because there were some distinctive buildings, three-story, five-story, low ones, short ones, fat ones, river mounts. Corsell, for example, on Juno Beach is a big river estuary there. kind of yeah. gives away where you are there. Um, so it, 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 it depends where you are as to how you use But if you, people often don't notice those bigot maps, the ones of the, there's the east one and the west one of Omar, running on the bottom of them is a, a compilation of a, of a side view aerial photo like that. Most people don't yeah. notice, often they're cropped. So you just see the map, but running on the bottom, lining up with the map is the oblique same version. But of course, on the pra practically on the day with smoke and gunfire, it, but it's, yeah. it's good to have it, whether whether it works perfectly or not. It's a good resource to give to people. And I think in the planning, obviously, they've thought about it. So you know, each of the beaches was then split into little sections, and each of those was then photographed. So the the idea was there. I mean, obviously, you know, best laid plans and all that. If something's going to go wrong somewhere down the line, uh, but it's a it's sort of a good a good way to show what the level of planning that had gone into D-Day, um, it wasn't uh, sort of a thrown together type thing. You know, they've gone to the, the extent of having uh, landing photographs and models of the beach you're going to step onto in the hope that people landing won't be completely thrown off. It's, uh, you know, something a bit more uh, recognisable. And with that familiarity, hopefully the soldiers aren't quite so sort of, um, yeah. you know, thrown out of balance. Um, now, again, obviously, I bet there are more people who want to see aeroplanes. So now's a good time. Uh, Americans, um, by sort of the, the last sort of chunk of time before D-Day, we needed an awful lot of up to date every single day photos, which was well out of the British, the RAF sort of capability that there was too much to do. And so luckily, when the Americans arrived originally with their lightnings, um, they started to really concentrate on photographing Normandy. There was some British squadrons that we set up some sort of like photo reconnaissance wings, again, just to photograph the Normandy landing areas, which like we were saying, almost did give the game away because the increased air traffic. But at that point we had little choice we needed to do it, I suppose. Uh, a nice thing with the, the American aircraft is that the tricycle undercarriage of the Lightning means that uh, it's very easy to taxi, take off and land uh, a Lightning compared to the Spitfire with its nose up stance. Uh, and all the American pilots were coming over, getting into a Spitfire uh, for the first time. And because they wanted to see where they're going, they were lifting the tails up on their takeoff a bit too quickly, which meant that they were starting to shave the tips of the propellers off as their nose went too far. And it was sort of grinding against the ground. And the American air crews were getting very embarrassed having to ask for replacement uh, propellers all the time because their pilots just weren't used to flying Spitfires. Uh, they very quickly got the hang of it. And uh, I think um, 
it's the only case where the Americans really were using Spitfires and Mosquitoes, as far as I'm aware. I'm Somebody's going to correct me now, but in general... Uh, in general, yeah. They, yeah. they use a couple of Mosquitoes or Bombers here and there, but yeah, yeah. generally that's where, yeah. That's, that's, okay. So, yeah, I mean, these, the, the Spit and the Mozzie there obviously have their invasion stripes, so that must be, you know, on the day or thereabouts yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so they were sort of taking huge numbers of photographs, which, as we said, you know, did very nearly give give things away. Um, but there were some very specific things that needed to be photographed. The next slide uh, shows a sort of map of the coast marking the radar sites that the Germans have. And this is coming back to that idea that we talked about earlier of the deception. Uh, we wanted to knock out enough radar sites to mean that our invasion fleet and aircraft could get to France without being seen. However, we had stuff going on over near Dover in Kent, which was meant to distract the Germans. So those radar sites had to be left intact. But we couldn't do it in such a way that was obvious that we were leaving those ones but destroying the Normandy ones, because that would be as obvious as announcing where we were going. And so this sort of, like you, I think you described it as a game of chess almost. There's this, uh, we'll destroy a lot of the Normandy ones and we'll destroy some of the Calais ones, but we won't look make it look obvious and we'll possibly even intentionally miss some radar sites and this is, this, this is where information comes because and interestingly this is going to be the topic of friday's show matt bone is coming on to talk about the no ball raids taking out these radar things and so I, i'll let him do that yeah, bit i'm yeah. guessing we're thinking you know well maybe that one is the earlier model radar so that's not quite efficient so maybe that one could be the one we leave alone but that one down there that's the latest one with the latest that we should definitely knock that one out but lee again having this balancing act so that we've done the job of elimination but not done it in such a way to then spoil and we covered that with our with Tom Withington. We'd covered the uh, the the dropping of the window, the the foils trips that this yeah. evening. We've done that on a previous show in RAF week. So again, to you all, eventually all these shows kind of link up. But, but this is this is the complexity of it, where and it isn't this, just taking photos. It's it's now we've got information, but now how can we best use this information, but not let them know we've got the information and and make effective use of it. Um, this, this is someone's got to think. Oh, someone's got to balance this all up and, and weigh weigh all the pros and cons and say, okay, these are the ones we're going to knock out. And it's because it'd be easier to say, well, knock them all out. Oh, hang on, we, we can't knock out the ones we need to find our fake. Yeah, quite. Cool. Yeah, and, and I've used the example of radar sites because it's quite an easy one to sort of get your head around. But I think that's going on with uh, railway marshalling yards and roads and bridges and factories and every level of planning has to think what do we need to leave what do we need to destroy you know they destroyed some bridges to stop the sort of counterattack, which was sort of common german yeah. tactics was a counterattack. but then we need some bridges to help us get a foothold in france so which ones do you choose and which ones do you leave and again it's you need to know the information and having the the photograph that being able to see it in front of you i think makes the life of a organizing planning sort of committee yeah, much easier. If, you, if you've got a map and there are two bridges 100 miles apart but all you've got is the map that's not enough to say okay we want to leave one and knock one out when you go look and you go okay that one actually that's got the right kind of banks that we could put a bailey bridge over that quite quickly so that one there is perhaps the one we should that one the other bridge though conversely would take a long time to so so you leave the one up and this this is this, this is where the, the refined use of the aerial photos is going to be able to make that decision in an informed way and as david o'keefe said that i think it's my point making we're not necessarily not knocking out some of these radars we're leaving them for the last minute is the point making so that one we'll try and knock out on the morning of june the 6th or, or yeah the, quite the, possibly yeah but the earlier ones we're going to knock that out in March, so it's about deciding not just which, but in which or in which priority as well. And then that extends to uh, when we're sending our gliders in to capture the the bridges near Khan. Well, obviously they were decided early on we needed those specific bridges. We can't just leave that to chance. We don't want to destroy them, so we need to have a plan in place to make sure we have them. Uh, otherwise, the the whole sort of getting your foothold and that sort of thing won't work. And so it's it's again like photographing the thirty two thousand square miles. It wasn't just the coastline. You know, getting on 
beaches on you know get soldiers onto a beach is relatively simple in a sense it's actually doing something once you're there that's the the, the difficult part the the you know the next stage of turning those soldiers into some sort of uh which holding and areas to build airfields which the suitable ones yeah. where we can we can we can push them down what the road network's like so on and so forth all that complicated thing as well and that that yeah that's that's yeah, yeah. and then the, the planning goes down to ridiculous levels i mean they they had um uh, geologists come into RAF Medmenham to look at the oblique photos of the beaches to talk about the type of gravel and sand and rock that they'd be encountering so they can understand how that was. They could then build sort of fake uh, sections of beach with similar gravel and rock to see how that affected vehicles. And so we knew whether our vehicles would be able to drive on certain beaches. And, that was then reinforced. We had frogmen going in collecting soil samples, and that's it was uh, a you know huge sort of task to collect enough information to yeah. to make uh, you know those the decisions. Sending the frogmen from the midget submarines to go to the beach with those beaches that they would need would have been the ones identified by the aerial photos. The aerial photos yeah. are your first and it's okay. We think we know what that one is. Here we're not certain. Maybe halfway down that beach, it looks like it might go from rock to sand. That's when you send in the guy to confirm. So yeah. it. It's refining and refining of information. Yeah, and of, of course, I mean, you've only got a certain amount of, amount of frog men who could do that. So you don't want to be, try and do every single beach in northern France. But if you've only got a choice of three, then that's an easy sort of uh, decision to make. Yeah. Um, and this this final picture, uh, obviously, on the morning of, possibly on the afternoon of, uh, 6th of June. Uh, and you can quite clearly see boats landing. You can see vehicles have made roadways uh and the importance there is all of these vehicles are funneling towards set points because we know where we can get on and off the beaches um and so it, it's planning like that that like i said you're getting the getting a truck onto a beach is relatively simple obviously you've got to dodge the enemy firing at you but once you're on the beach what on earth do you do then you've got to know where to go and what to do and what what's the next stage and i think that that is sort of the ne next level of planning that you know aerial photography really sort of yeah, helped I mean, lead I mean, into. and that's exactly where we can make that direct parallel with juno beach for example because and a, and a map would have because maps only have what three or four classifications of roads there's the a roads b roads c roads but what we could have seen on 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 someone like juno which is urban is that, that road has high buildings either side of it and is distinctly narrower than that road which is wider but only seems to have a wall one side and building on the side so therefore that road we can expand that widen that one quite easily by removing that one wall on the left boom bulldozers tanks now you've got an artery which is exactly the kind of information we would use so that when the troops are filing off they know that it's not that road not that road that's the one to head for which because we've we've got we've talked about before the avaries the building the bridges the ramps off the beaches we're not plopping those ramps in randomly along the beach on the first bit we get to we're putting those ramps in directly in line with the best per planned route route off that beach based on this information which are then hopefully has been reinforced by the local information coming back as well the brave resistance guys the soe guys all that who are then sending back saying this seems to be the road that the germans are using this is the one with the checkpoints or this is the one that hasn't got mines on it for example or has got and this is a database of information that you can put together a successful landing um, yeah and yeah. Have a, someone to uh Marian did ask if we can mention i've got to go back and find the uh question she said about something or other navigation and i can't find her comment there she's maybe she'll ask it again something navigation she asked i may i i can't find it now damn it's got so much <laughs> oh here we are at some point we need to talk about the impact of the decker navigation system ah very good i'm gonna hope you're gonna enlighten me there oh i was hoping you were gonna enlighten me there well okay. done uh that's yeah that's, uh yeah um I don't know. I'm going to have to hold my hand up and say I don't know, which I think is an important lesson for all historians. Yeah, it's humanity. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, um, I don't David know. is saying that we didn't. We, we, we right at the beginning, he was saying we should have talked about the uh, the topographical departments that were involved in playing, which is the next level up. Again, that's another show as well. That's the that's the taking the maps. Yeah, I forget. Um, is it MI nine or MI eight or one of those was topographical, and they they were specifically to do with finding you know maps and figuring out how all of this sort of went um 
Uh, and so it was, you know, as important, like you say, you know, it's just another string to the... Um, Our deck of navigation is my receiving radio signals. Okay, so I'm, yeah. Um, okay, that's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, so in that, that, there was quite a few systems, uh, both allies and German use similar sort of um, radio signals triangulating to, to, to guide. I've not heard of the deck one before, but uh, I suspect we, it was... We a... also had the question, and then we'll kind of leave it, there, about whether or not the British or American camera systems were better, or indeed whether they were using the same ones by a certain part of the war. Um, and better, of course, is a very subjective term, but, but you know, as uh, a camera it, guy, is there anything, any kind of comment on that that comes to mind? Uh, in general, the British cameras were, were better, and the Americans tended to use ours certainly when they started using spitfires and mosquitoes more um the the lightning had all sorts of problems in europe that it hadn't encountered in the far east because of uh, weather conditions so you know it's colder and damper in europe effectively which affected it in different ways and so the british cameras were more suited to our theater but they did yeah, have be a better system and we we had a better sort of uh, not just the camera itself, but the whole system of taking, developing, interpreting that everything we, we'd sort of really got it down. Whereas the Americans had a system, it wasn't quite as advanced. Of course, the German lenses, their Zeiss lenses were probably the best, but they didn't have the entire sort of network backing up those lenses to mean that they never really had uh, as good a whole system. Whereas they got some really nice individual photos, they just didn't do anything with them particularly compared yeah, no, to that makes sense. No, I mean well, yeah, this is this is um yeah, we we I think we've come to a natural point maybe to end this particular show there. But it, you know, the 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 the, the rabbit holes that are, are just <laughs> huge with this and you realise it's, it's another subject that not only my guests know about is that you know, my, the people watching clearly know their subject as well, which is is kind of scary in some ways, is how much they know. I'm always I'm always pleasantly surprised by how much detail they can add to things and you know david o'keefe is incredibly good on the on dieppe and, and intelligence and, and and the use of that and you know and all, all we can attempt to do in these shows is kind of highlight something and make make people go away thinking there's a lot more to that than i had thought about and and that's i think that all we can hope to do with this but it's a it's a fascinating subject and without certainly it's 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 we can we can say at the end of this without the importance of aerial photos and it was i forget what the figure i wrote it down that the number of photos we had in 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 Mendeman by the end of the war was some was it three hundred thousand or so one one million millions i think yeah millions. they were they were at times they were they were interpreting sort of tens of thousands in a month uh you know it was such oh, and we, should mention, sorry, we should mention constant babington's well we have already but her, her claim to fame, really, and she's portrayed by Sylvia Sims in the film Operation Crossbow, is one of the key people identifying the first um, V1 ramps. Uh, again, it's probably another show, but the whole search for the V weapons is an, an amazing subject on its own and possibly something to come back to at a later date because uh, there is a whole, again, not just photography, but there were uh, people on the ground and there were secret conversations taped by resistance agents and all sorts, yeah, you know, it's a, a, a you know, it's sort of a massive and very good story in itself. So it's definitely worth. It is. It's definitely, it's definitely worth tackling. The, the, the whole program of that is is something, and and it and and the bombing, and then and then the, and you've got the Spitfires and stuff tipping wings. There's the whole aviation aspect of dealing. There's the finding out about V and V. Uh, uh, well, there's the development from the German side of V weapons. There's the Allies finding out about what they did. There's the what effect they had when they started using them, and then how we started trying to stop them being effective once they started. There's, there's at least four. I was going to say that sounds like a week of programs to me. Uh, so. it easily, it e yeah, crossbow could easily <laughs> be a week of programs, yeah. and and still and still not cover it all. But anyway, I'll be, I'll be back for that one then. Yeah, come back. This is fascinating talking to you, Alex, and I can't wait for you to go out and do, see some of your history teller shows because it's just. Yeah, you, you, you always bring this passion to stuff. So that's really good. So I'm going to remind people what they got coming up and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, this is part one of the build up to D-Day week. We've got Ben Main on tomorrow who's watching tonight. We had a pre-chat show chat this afternoon about what we're going to cover tomorrow about the training for D-Day. And again, we're not going to cover everything tomorrow because there's training for D-Day. There's specific things people were trained for, specific problems like breaching walls. Then there was just 
intensive training to prepare soldiers to enable to land in in an invasion and they're not quite the same thing but we've got some great footage i had uh, some world war ii tv fans have taken footage of of um hankley common and sheriff muir in scott two places in britain where the training was done and we're going to talk about that tomorrow we'll tell you some funny stories of men who went through training commando training fibula urban warfare training was done before d-day so lots of stuff tomorrow to talk about Again, potential rabbit holes. But right now, it remains me to say thank you very much, Alex Burnham, for joining right, us. Thank you. thank you. And again, check out the links links to History Tellers down there. And some of your shows are absolutely brilliant. The the, the uh, and and subjects that you'd never think would fit into history. The the eighteen inch tall uh, <laughs> the um, cavalryman from the English Civil War. You know, yeah. And you think I'm making that one up? But no, they were genuinely was. A very very tight. It's another. He's thinking. No, they've made that one up. No, check out the history tellers. Look at them out. You're, they, there's some amazing stuff. So there you are. Thanks very much, Alex. Thank everybody for watching. And um, check out the links. Consider becoming a patron. Consider going and seeing what the history tellers are doing. And I will see you all again tomorrow for D-Day training. Good night, everybody. Cheers, Alex. Thank you.